Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is the session called Digital Subversion and Digital Restriction. And I'll introduce your panelists for the afternoon. So, oh, you guys did? No, you didn't. Okay. I thought you switched on me. Uh, to my immediately left is uh, John Falker, who is director of the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, which we know in the U.S. as NCIC. Uh, it's a 24-hour center overseen by the Department of Homeland Security that analyzes and coordinates uh, response to significant cyber threats. Uh, next to him is Tal Moses, a partner in Ernst & Young. He's been uh, working in cybersecurity since 1989 and has founded several cybersecurity companies. Next to him is Rado Danulak, co-founder and CEO of Tachium. Uh, it's a startup providing data center services and device hardware. And next to him is Tony Anscom, global security evangelist and industry partnerships ambassador for ESET, a cybersecurity firm based actually here in Bratislava. Uh, first of all, I just want to apologize for the red blotch I've got here. I had a little accident at the train station yesterday in Copenhagen. Um, but everything's fine, and uh, we'll get going. So um, our focus here today is on critical infrastructure and what uh, nation states and private industry could and should be doing to uh, secure critical infrastructure and national security. And um, I want to just sort of, uh, sort of set the tone for what we're talking about and what we're not talking about. Uh, you know, in 2007, there were cyber attacks in Estonia. And a lot of people have termed those, in some cases, as critical infrastructure attacks, but they, were, they weren't really. These were sort of information, kind of warfare influence operations that, uh, that uh, upset government systems and media systems. Um, the DNC hacks, the hacks against Il Hillary Clinton and the DNC servers, and even of Emmanuel Macron, were not critical infrastructure. Um, you know, there's talk in the U.S. of turning voting systems, actual election systems, into critical infrastructure. But the, the systems around there, we don't generally determine, uh, determine, uh, term as critical infrastructure. But we'll get into a little more about what we do call it critical infrastructure. But I wanted to talk about sort of attacks that we have seen that have been against uh, critical infrastructure. And these were attacks, when we're talking about attacks against critical infrastructure, we have three different kinds. You have a denial of service attack that can take down a production process or take down systems. You have destruction, which can either be data destruction, such as wiping data from a system, or actually causing physical destruction of the computers themselves or of equipment that the computers control. Um, and uh, we also have something that we actually haven't seen that much of yet, uh, and that is uh, data integrity attacks where you're actually altering the data, the code, or something in the system that alters, uh, that affects the integrity of a system. So if you think about, let's say, financial systems, if someone can get in and alter um, the accounting software or get into the stock system and change stocks, um, or get into weapon systems and change code uh, so that the weapon systems don't work. So that's something that's sort of the, the future fear um, that a lot of intelligence agencies have now, um, and that's something that we will likely see. So, um, so a couple of the examples that we've seen so far are the Shamoon attack, uh, which uh, uh, targeted Saudi Aramco systems in 2012. In that case, it wiped data from about more than 30,000 systems. Um, and we've had, of course, the Stuxnet attack, which is an example of a critical infrastructure attack that caused physical destruction of systems controlled by uh, digital systems. And then um, we had the, this was a denial of service attack, which was the Ukraine power grid hacks. Uh, we had two examples of that in 2015 and then a repeat in 2016. Um, just to, affecting parts of the grid, took out about uh, power to about 230,000 residents between one and six hours. So those are the kinds of things we're looking at. Of course, the electric grid is the primary critical infrastructure because it undergirds every else, every other for, uh, infrastructure. So if you can take out the critical, if you can take out the electric grid um, over an extensive period of time, days, weeks, months, which you could do, if you don't just take down the power but you also destroy the equipment like the generators. There was a test of this in the US, if anyone is familiar with the Aurora generator test, where they were able to destroy a generator in about three minutes um, with um, 21 lines of code. Um, so if you can take down, obviously, power for extensive periods of time, then, of course, we're talking about uh, affecting commerce, we're talking about affecting hospitals, um, and eventually, you know, some kind of death. Um, 
So a lot of things uh, are hinging on the, uh, the grid. But the kinds of attack that would take down a grid for an extensive period of time would not need to be a very sophisticated attack. And you don't need to be sophisticated to affect critical infrastructure in a very harmful way. And the WannaCry attack, of course, is a prime example of that. There's been a lot of talk about how badly that was uh, executed and how badly it was coded. Uh, and yet it was extremely effective in taking down uh, hospital services, uh, critical services, including surgeries, uh, for quite a while. So um, you don't need uh, a nation state uh, to attack critical infrastructure. When we're talking about the threats, there are a lot of threats. You could have insider threats. But what we're going to focus on uh, for the purposes of our talk today are um, looking at uh, sort of terror elements, uh, terrorist elements, um, warfare, offensive operations by nation states, and hacktivism, uh, those kinds of attacks from outside. So I want to um, talk about, first of all, uh, defining what we mean by critical infrastructure. I think a lot of people were surprised uh, after the Sony attack in 2014 that the U.S. government considered a motion picture studio critical infrastructure. And in the U.S. we have 16 sec sectors of critical infrastructure. And if you go through that list, it's quite extensive and it covers pretty much everything. Um, and I know that not every country defines critical infrastructure the same. So I wanted to throw this out to the panelists. First of all, uh, how are we defining critical infrastructure? Yeah, uh, this is Tal. I think first the terminology of critical infrastructure is a bit confusing and, and eliminating the way we think about it. Each country will define it a bit differently. So there will be a critical infrastructure like power grid, uh, power plants and so on, then secondary critical infrastructure like banking system, uh, hospitals and so on. Um, but I want to take it into a bit of a wider definition. I don't know if you all agree with me or disagree with me, but as we're looking on countries, countries are not just borders or the people living in it, and critical infrastructure is supposed to be any infrastructure which is supporting the living in the country. And everything that will be a disruption to this infrastructure will disrupt the country. So. The obvious example are the power grid, power plants, hospital, banking, and so on. But what about a breakfast cereal factory that could be attacked potentially, and let's say the iron tables will be changed to make it a bit poisonous? Is that a critical infrastructure or not? So I think it's a lot of uh, philosophical issues as well, what's critical and what's not. And the influence of this definition is Who's taking responsibility of protecting that, the government or the private sectors in some cases? Um, that's my two cents regarding CI. Yeah, Tim. So, so I, I think um, I, I've just presented actually this week at a, a GSMA event in The Hague uh, talking about I, IoT devices. Um, and IoT, most of us would think about being a consumer, you know, the things around our home. But that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about the smart city. Um, they're talking about everything being connected. You know, the things that are monitoring water levels, the things that are you know, in our factories. That once, we, once we get into a smart city, then actually the entire city is part of our infrastructure. And I'm not sure you can actually start to make a definition of this is part of our infrastructure and this is not. Because if I can attack your traffic network and bring your city to a standstill, is that, is that critical infrastructure? Probably. What about a motion picture studio? Well, you, you know, I, I, I saw your note before, be, uh, before our panel uh, uh, about that, and actually broadcasters probably are part of critical infrastructure because it's a method for government to talk to its citizens. So maybe that's the definition that was used there, I, and I don't know specifically. Okay. John? Oh, Rado, did you want to go first? Yeah, so briefly, uh, you know, the concept of critical infrastructure is now being extended. You know, for example, we have self-driving cars. Imagine that state or non-state actor can cause mass casualties. So critical infrastructure now is rapidly expanding. And if we over-expanded infrastructure, uh, will be very hard to basically spend meaningful effort to control it. So we need to be careful to really define piece what we can handle, not overextend it, because we need a lot of resources to handle it. Okay. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with Rado that if it gets too broad, then it you know, you really don't defend anything. Uh, to Tal's point, I think it's a, it may be a national decision what's critical in your country and how do you defend what's critical in your country as opposed to trying to defend everything all the time. Mm 
So basically, if, if everything is critical, really nothing, nothing is, is critical. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk then about who's responsible for protecting critical infrastructure. Is it the government? Is it intelligence agencies um, who are more likely to actually have sort of an advanced view of threats that may be coming down the pike? Um, and of course, we're, we're, we have to make a distinction between privately owned critical infrastructure and government owned critical infrastructure. So I mean, the case of government owned critical, critical infrastructure, um, should it be uh, civilian government? Should it be the intelligence agencies? Who, who should have the responsibility there? I'm, I'm not sure there's a difference between government owned and privately owned critical infrastructure. It's all critical. Um, I think the, the, the larger question is who's responsible for defending that, that infrastructure and um, the way we operate. And, and you've mentioned a couple of different possible players that are a part of that equation. The, at the end of the day, the asset owner is respons responsible for defending the network. But government, and the intelligence community, and law enforcement all have a, have a play in supporting that defense. For example, you know, the, there are a lot of uh, uh, rural utilities in the United States, electricity, for example. Um, and their IT guy probably also serves as their financial guy and probably the jan jan janitor, right? Uh, so how, how competent is that one person going to be in defending that? So, so those kinds of facilities need, need the intelligence and, and uh, the information and the support to help do their defense better. So uh, ac actually every piece of that infrastructure has its own responsibility because government cannot guarantee or cannot protect against a vendor doing poor job and leaving vulnerabilities. Government can set the standards which uh, vendors has to adhere to. So, so the government responsibility is defining the policy, defining the standards. Vendors, they have to meet the requirements to the standards. And the owner of the system, they need to adhere to standards of physical protection and so on. So every piece has own responsibility and component. And, but the standard setting and, and the governance is really a job of the government. Well, are you talking about voluntary standards or actually talking about regulation? Uh, see, uh, on, on uh, a lot of critical uh, national infrastructure, uh, it's hard to rely on voluntary standards because uh, they are not met. And how you guarantee certain uh, standard of safety relying only on voluntary compliance. So, I believe that the role is really in standardization body and government setting requirements and policies. Uh, if they are not set, there is no driving mechanisms for vendors to comply and accomplish that level of security. Yeah. So, so one of the problems with, with standards of, of when governments issue standards is um, governments typically can't keep pace. Um, uh, and that's a challenge. That's a huge, huge challenge because you've got to go, go put it through a legislative process and you've got to get it agreed by industry and the rest of the government and it's it's tough for them to do so I don't know whether there's some other way whether there's a more flexible standard approach but it would seem sensible for there to be you know what one thing industry is good at is actually finding innovative ideas for, for protection or to do things differently whereas if you have a written standard and you corner industry into into a certain way of doing it then you, you also take out some of the innovation, which is not a good thing. But you are relying in that sense uh, quite a lot on voluntary. So a lot of the problems that we have with critical infrastructure are not necessarily, they are however, with the owners of the critical infrastructure, but there are deeper problems in terms of the products and the software, uh, the hardware and the software. And many of these, and particularly industrial control systems that control uh, power plants, that control chemical plants, that even control traffic lights, um, they were never designed with security in mind. They were designed 20 years ago, and you can't slap security on them really in, in, in order to secure them. You've got to re-architect and redesign them. So is there a role for government? Because if, if, if the customers aren't demanding security from the vendors, is there a role for government to sort of set a minimum standard uh, for any security product? And I'll just give you an example. Um, medical devices. We have the Federal Drug Administration in the U.S. that oversees the testing uh, and reliability of medical devices before they can go on the record. They never had a security component to medical devices until I think it was last year after researchers uh, found a, a, a number of security problems with pacemakers and drug infusion pumps and uh, diabetes insulin pumps and things like that. So is there a role that government can play in 
um, uh, uh, requiring certain products, industrial control system products, if they're going to go into critical infrastructure, that they have a higher level, and maybe that's a way of raising the security for everyone if you get the product more secure. Yeah. Well, you, you raise an interesting point, because there was an article this morning in the news about medical devices, mm -hmm. specifically about pacemakers. Um, and to bring it back to what you just said, the difference between voluntary and mandatory, 49% uh, of the medical companies that were talked to by that survey said they don't adhere to the standards set. I'm sorry, they don't what? They don't adhere to the standards mm. that were set by the, the drug agency. So there, there we have manufacturers already admitting they don't because it's a voluntary standard. So somewhere along the line you have to make it a mandatory standard. At some point, you have to make that decision. Yeah. It, it comes down to a risk decision, essentially. And, and on the part of the manufacturer, I think it's a risk decision that's based upon um, what are we, how are we going to, how are we going to profit from making this piece of equipment or this, this set of code uh, to to do what it's supposed to do? And where's the balance between uh, the profit and the and the security that you would build in? And how much risk are we willing to uh, accept? And then the, the buyer also has to take a look at. All right. Uh, if these are the standards, and I can prove that, you, that you've met those standards, then I'm willing to accept that product. But if, it, if, you, if you don't, then, then I won't, or I, I will hold you to them if I'm going to buy your product. I agree. And I think the government <coughs> place is to guide and to help the critical infrastructure from governmental and private sector to comply with a certain level of security, but also agree with Radislav that it's a shared responsibility. It's about time that private and governmental sector will, sector will try, um, start to require warranty from vendors, from IT vendors, security product vendors for the product. So if you sell an antivirus and I got hacked by a virus, I want you to be, uh, to give me warranty and, and be responsible for that. So once you start sharing the responsibility, you start raising the, the awareness for the risks. So I, I will go slightly, uh, slightly further. Uh, today, concepts uh, are basically reactive. There is pool of the, you know, of the potential vulnerabilities, uh, and uh, you know, we are trying to build defenses after the fact. Uh, you know, the systems are not designed by, con uh, say, by construction. Uh, technology and uh, exists to do that. Uh, from capability-based system and so on. And uh, the issue what it is, there is no enough pressure currently to build the system in a in more formal way, which has certain provable guarantees. Uh, technology and uh, theory exist, but there is no pressure uh, sufficient currently, and the damage from vulnerability is not big enough to basically go that uh, different path. And uh, I can see the role of the government in the form of, uh, you know, uh, supporting that coming from pushing on more university the technology to incorporate that to the system because Unix came from the universities. Uh, sometimes, uh, for example, government directly improves the technology like VA Linux where NSA invested money to improve cross the border infrastructure and start building stronger platform. So I believe that uh, the government role will be needed and more necessary to push new methodology uh, which uh, commercial entities are not deploying but still exist. We also know that governments move really slowly though, and you mentioned the, the standards. I mean, it can take in the U.S. for technological standards three, or five, three to five years uh, to have them go through the approval process and the commenting, commenting period. What if we're talking about not critical infrastructure like what we're ordinarily used to that are providing, uh, you know, kind of water services, electric grid, but if we're talking about the Internet itself and the infrastructure that undergirds the, the Internet and the communications infrastructure. We've had a number of major uh, and, and serious attacks. Um, obviously, the Dyn attack, which was uh, using the Mirai botnet, using um, surveillance cameras to attack Dyn Corporation, which provides... Uh, DNS services, which resolves where you go on the internet, and of course websites were inaccessible. Um, we've had uh, BGP routing attacks, where uh, entire swaths of communication, IP addresses, are basically just hijacked by someone and sent to another location, uh, possibly copied, and then sent on to the location where they should go. The BGP problems um, have been known for 20 years, uh, and they haven't been fixed yet, and, and it's uh, required 
you know, it, it largely relies on the telecoms agreeing to make the changes that they need to make. Um, and SS7, which has been in the news recently, SS7 tax, uh, believed to be happening in uh, D.C. and other areas. SS7 is the protocol that, uh, uh, it, it's part of the telecom protocol, the mobile pro protocol that allows uh, a telecom, if you're here in Bratislava, uh, but your phone company is in London, uh, the phone company here can tell the London company that you're here and reroute your calls here. It's not secure. And so someone can actually, if they know your phone number and they have access to the SS7 protocol and infrastructure, they can route your phone call to their system, record it, and send it on to its location. And it was used by criminals recently, uh, believed to be in Russia, where they weren't looking to get the phone calls, but they were getting the uh, two-factor authentication text messages that were going to mobile phones uh, for banking accounts. Uh, so they already had the passwords through phishing attacks, and they needed the uh, two-factor authentication text messages. So um, these are critical infrastructure. The problems have been known for years. Uh, in some cases, some entities, telecoms, have taken some steps, not enough. Um, where, where should the pressure be for rewriting the protocols? I mean, this is like starting from scratch, rewriting the protocols, fixing the protocols, fixing the routers, the hardware. Um, who's responsible for that? We all know that uh, the internet was not invented with security by design. Nothing we use in the internet is secure. Um, as, as we said before, if everything is critical, nothing is critical. We cannot say that everything is critical, and maybe it's also <laughs> the mean. So stealing uh, second factor authentication has got a business goal behind that, and not a terror attack, and it's not going to disrupt a whole country. And that could be be a responsibility of the business entity, the enterprise. While we're talking about <coughs> power grid or communications to, to people, not just for going to Facebook, that could be governmental. Um, as far as I know, in most countries, a lot of the security measures that are in communication channels, ISP and on, are being monitored by governmental in order to see they have the right security measures and they have to comply with certain policies that the governments have dictated. Usually it's not enough, but at least I know that the government helps the operators when they're being attacked. So there is a cooperation and there is a responsible, um, shared responsibility already going on. Okay, uh, so in, uh, actually we are in an interesting uh, time where uh, things will change. So most of the losses today uh, was uh, our economical losses, you know, we have uh, denial of service attack, you know, incur certain number of dollar losses, and uh, that's defined how much money can be spent to improve the infrastructure. There is some economical balance. That's what's t today, and that's why we have kind of shaky infrastructure. But we need to realize that with IoT and proliferation IoT, the losses, financial losses, 10 years down the road will translate to actually losses of uh, real uh, human life because it's one thing getting a uh, computer down. Uh, another thing is basically car in the middle of the driving basically stop self-driving cars stop actually working. So we need to very actively work where uh, economical balance, how much I spend on uh, security versus how much I'm losing when they are security events, that was that's defined the security level today will be not sufficient 10 years down the road when IoT will be proliferating to our life. That answer to your question about the SS7 yeah. is just what Rado said. It's a balance right now between um, how much it's going to cost to to start from scratch and as you said and and, and rebuild that protocol um, versus you know how, how, what could we do to make it make it better. It, it, it isn't an easy problem to solve. Mm -hmm. And what, what about sort of, and, and I want the audience to start thinking about questions we'll coming to you shortly. Um, what about, uh, you know, the code that is, like the open source code um, that has been problematic, the Heartbleed vulnerability, which was, a, again, a years old uh, vulnerability in code. It's open source, technically, people, can, anyone can look at it and find the vulnerabilities and no one did. Um, what about sort of uh, some kind of government, private sector, um, consortium that uh, funds a project that, um, uh, let's say, funds security researchers who will examine code like that? 
I mean, is, is that something that's worthwhile? And, and even something that could be done internationally, I, since I, everyone I, relies on that. I absolutely think it's worth considering um, that that's on the front end. Uh, already we've started uh, in the United States the Cyber Threat Alliance, which is looking at the threats which are on the back end. So I can see that as a possibility as of, of, of a way to approach it from, a, from the vulnerability perspective. Right now, it's, there's a lot of security researchers out there, and, and we all know they find vulnerabilities every day that nobody knew before. Mm -hmm. the, the youngster in the, in the UK that found the kill switch on, on WannaCry is a great example of that. Um, so potentially putting together some sort of consortium to look at things on the front end might not be a bad idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, software companies already do this to a certain degree bug now. Bug bounty programs. I mean, yeah, bug, yeah. yeah, bug bounty programs. And we pay the researcher to, to come to us responsibly, tell us about the issue so we can fix it. Um, I, just want to, I just want to come back and point out one other thing, though. When we're talking about all these attacks on infrastructure, there's a com there is a common theme. Typically involves a person. There's always, nearly always, human interaction, whether it's an SMS message somebody clicked on, whether it's an email somebody opened, whether it's a USB drive somebody put in the machine. I'm not sure, I, I'm actually not sure how you fix that piece yeah. and that engagement with the end user, I, the, I the, the those, human nature. Tony, I refer to those as stupid user tricks. <laughs> they, they, you know, and that's an inside threat uh, because there are people that do silly things. But I, you know, I think it's, I, I always feel like it's unfair when you blame the user because I'm a journalist and I get contacted by people I don't know all the time who are sending me things. It's my job to open attachments. It's my job to look at things from strangers. And I think it's the responsibility of the makers of the software and my sysadmin to create, configure a system um, that secures me even when I do that, even when I need to do that. So, and also, you know, a lot of those attacks are made to look like they're coming from your boss. You know, they're, they, they're really well designed these days. They don't have spelling errors and things like that. I try not so. to answer emails from my boss. <laughs> <laughs> Good tactic. Um, I, I, wanna just, I just go to his office and talk to him. Face. OK. Uh, are there questions? Because I want to go into some, OK. Edward? Hello, uh, Kim. It's uh, Edward Lucas from The Economist. Um, I, there's obviously no magic bullet to this. We're going to have to attack it from every direction, mixture of um, carrots and sticks and, and regulatory pressure and education and so on. But none of you have mentioned trustworthy software, and I'm wondering whether there's a, uh, there's a very interesting conference going on on Langsec at the, at the moment, um, which, and, and, and I'm wondering whether there's a role for the state in setting um, mandatory standards for using trustworthy software. Um, which is not you know, much more expensive than the regular software, but on if it's critical, maybe we should be saying you can't do a self-driving car because of the externalities, the damage it can do to other people, unless you have that. I also wonder whether we, you've mentioned the IoT, whether you're really saying we should be pulling the emergency brake on the IoT. We just shouldn't be going until you have you can guarantee that at least the firmware on these things is um, remotely updatable. Um, you're creating so many problems for the future, both in terms of, of vulnerabilities of the devices inside the home or wherever, but also in terms of becoming part of botnets and so on, um, that we should be really going for a sort of dramatic, uh, dramatic stop, or is that just impractical? Can yeah. we slow the pro pro proliferation of, of IoT? I don't think we can. And I think at the end of the day, it comes down to making a risk decision about how far we're willing to go. Uh, I'm not sure that the trustworthy software is going to be pervasive because, as you say, it's very expensive. Although, again, it comes down to risk. What am I willing to accept? Uh, also, uh, I would point out <coughs> that concept of trust chain in security, trustworthy software, it's illusion of the, sec uh, of the safety uh, for few reasons. Uh, either state actors or uh, extreme ideology, you know, employee, can put into work into company which has safety, which has which is trusted, yet they can plant uh, basically piece of the software subverting the software. So the methodology of relying on the trust, uh, you know, because the, so many people are involved, it doesn't work very well. And let's look at practical example. One of the largest damage to US uh, was done by. Uh, supposedly trustworthy people, people within NSA, people like Snowden, which have been cleared and trusted, 
So the concept of uh, trust chain is as weak as the weakest link. And, uh, you know, there are hundreds or thousands of software companies. We cannot clear every software, uh, basically, person uh, in that all the chain of the software infrastructure. So I would uh, basically point out we need to move to <coughs> a system designs uh, saved by construction. And that's where basically, uh, you know, this is underserved area, uh, which basically needs more attention. So instead of being reactive, the system is uh, safe by design. We shouldn't and we can't really stop the progress. We cannot stop IoT from happening. Uh, we, maybe we can explain the risk better, but we should never stop progress. Uh, look at motorbikes. People know the risk of riding motorbikes, but it's, it's, you get quicker to work and you like, right, you like the feeling of riding a bike, you won't stop even though you know the risk. So once people actually know the risk of using IoT, they can choose either to use it or not, but you cannot stop the progress. Other security should never be a disabler. It's an enabler. Um, look at the, the car brakes. Why do they invent the brakes in the cars? They didn't invent the brakes so you can stop. They invented the brakes so you can actually drive faster. If you wouldn't have brakes, you wouldn't drive. And this is the same should be with cyber security. We should allow this progress. Tony? So, so the, the, also, the trust thing uh, changes over time. I mean, I mean if, we, if we look at the, the WannaCry issue recently with the NHS, you know, my immediate reaction was, why are the NHS still using XP? I mean, it, it's, a, it's a huge question. And then, actually, I spoke to a doctor in the NHS <coughs> only to find out that their MRI scanner uses XP. And actually, it can't be updated because they can't afford to buy another MRI scanner. Now, when they purchased it, was that trusted software? It, it pro probably was. But as time moves on, what do you continually have to update the trust? Well, you, you know, you have to go even, if you're going to get to that level, you have to go even one level lower than that, and that's the chips. Where are our chips designed? Where are the majority of our chips coming from? China. Um, and so you've got a trust issue there um, with the manufacturing process. Where do you stop, you know? Um, there is no really uh, trusted source anywhere. Um, yeah, go ahead. I think uh, I like this. Sorry. Uh, you're all using metaphors from the world of consumer products. Uh, to extend that metaphor, however, I think you need to remember the role that insurance companies have played. And no one's mentioned that. Yes, you can ride a motorbike, but if you do, your rates go up. And if you're a private company and you're reckless, you can't get insurance. Why not just make it an insurance issue, a private sector issue? You want to cheap on, be cheap on security? Go ahead. Be prepared for class action lawsuits that put you out of business. So there, there's, a, there's a huge debate about that now, in, in, uh, in the United States anyway. Um, the, the insurance companies have, have started to do those, those things that you described. They don't have the actuarial tables like they would for life insurance or fire insurance, which go back hundreds of years to make decisions, but they've stepped out and have started to make decisions based upon a small amount of data to, to insure. Uh, I think the bigger question when it, when it comes to insurance and cyber is what's, what's an acceptable standard of security? That has got to be decided first. You know, it's all over the map. And it depends, it depends what sector you sit in. Um, so what, what's the due care that you're going to hold somebody to when they purchase an insurance policy? And, and how do you define that due care? And is it different from an electric grid as it might be at Sony or with a healthcare manufacturer? It, it, it may be, I don't know, but th I think you're right. I think that, 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 uh, that we should have that discussion. Yeah, I, I just, you, you talk about the insurance industry, and so the, there are a lot of different ways of coming at this. And one interesting example that we had recently in the U.S. was with the, the medical uh, short stocking, uh, sh shorting of the stock. Uh, it was a company that had medical device. Muddy Waters. Sorry? Muddy Waters. Yes. Um, so unsecured the system, and the researchers found vulnerabilities, and they decided to short the stock. Um, and because it was, you know, a lot of companies are told about vulnerabilities in their systems and they shrug their shoulders and they'll say, it's, it's not a real vulnerability, uh, it's a theoretical vulnerability, or we'll get to it when we can and three years later the product is still insecure. And so they're going after it, uh, you know, in, in a different kind of financial way. There's, there's some debate about that, though. I mean, the, the vulnerability became known 
should they have followed the responsible disclosure process to allow the company to make a fix uh, before they went public with it? I'm not sure that that was the case. I think mm. they wanted to profit from it yes. uh, before the There is a lot of controversy around there, it. There, yeah. there's whether, a big and debate. whether it's really effective, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Karsten Fries. I work at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Um, I, I, I've been to many conferences about cybersecurity, and usually the word that pops up very early is uh, resilience, and I haven't heard it yet. Uh, and usually it's a kind of magic word that nobody really knows what it means, except we all know we have to kind of bounce back and be a back copper and running again a bit faster. But I assume most of you agree that some sort of resilience is, is part of the solution. I, I don't know if, if you want to elaborate on that, especially in the context of IoT, if that's really doable, or if that's a concept you basically have to, to rethink. Well, security requires layers. <coughs> yeah, uh, and the analogy I would use is, is actually, uh, you know, so I think somebody talked about cars earlier on. Let's, let's think about a car. You know, back in 1950 something or other, somebody designed a three point seat belt. Then somebody found that you could contract the seat belt into the floor. Then somebody came up with you know, a sensor and a safety device. We call it an airbag. Yeah? Uh, and now you have automated safety systems in cars that will stop before I hit the other car. The seatbelt's still in the car. And that's the important of the resilience, isn't it? Is my seatbelt is still there and my airbag's there and I'm not going to hit the car in front. Yeah? So security is, my, always has to be deployed in layers. Um, I'm not sure how that fits in an IoT world. I don't think anybody truly is at the moment because I don't think anybody understands what security should look like. You know, you're starting to see some standards come out. Um, but yeah, resilience is a good word. I think you, it depends on where you sit is how you define resilience. We, we look at resilience in ANKIC as being able to continue your business or your mission. Uh, and so there are a lot of parts to that. One part is security. But other parts are, um, how, do we exercise our procedures uh, when, when we have a bad day? Um, d is the leadership of our organization um, switched on to that exercise, and do they know what to do if, if it's a really bad day? Just recently in, in the WannaCry incident, we dealt with a healthcare uh, facility who, uh, first of all, it's important to understand, and our mission is um, asset response, so it's, it's mitigation, stop the bleeding. And so we were dealing with a hospital. It was very clear to us that that hospital had done those things. Their leadership owned the problem. The chairman of the hospital knew exactly what to do and, and knew that this was an issue. Um, the, the, the rest of the organization did all the right things when this was sensed in their, in their facility. So they were able to segment some of the MRIs that can't possibly be protected uh, away from uh, the, the connections to the electric, uh, electronic health records uh, to make them usable again. Um, they were able to segment other parts of their facilities um, in rapid fashion as this was going on so that they were able to be resilient and able to continue doing what the hospital had to do. Uh, I, I would also uh, like to point a uh, significant shift which is starting but it, in a few years will be in full swing. It almost sounds like uh, the lower causes device more security needs. It sounds completely counterintuitive but let me make an example. We have PCs, we have laptops, they are thousand dollar devices, we can afford paying thirty dollars antivirus and services on that. Now if I have uh, you know intelligent microwave, I cannot spend thirty dollars of running antivirus on that. It has to just work. TV has to just work. Yeah. So the basically the the model, economical model and balance between money spent on uh, on basically securing system is uh, basically even more important in IoT because they are lower cost devices. The things which work like antivirus, we cannot afford on intelligent light bulb, which is one dollar device. We cannot run that. So these systems, they have different requirements. And again, is driven by economic balance, nothing else. Economy is the most powerful force. We need, just need to understand and harness that. I want to go back to what we started the discussion with critical infrastructure. And we're talking about critical infrastructure and IoT together. And most of the problems happens when you take OT, operational technology, and move it into IoT. The water gauge is not new. It's existed for 20 years, some of them 12 years. And now they're making new water gauges with Ethernet adapter become more <coughs> with better connectivity. 
But this is not where the problem is. Yes, it's not secured. It's easy to break, but nobody can get to it. The problem starts when you make it into IoT, when you can control it remotely. And the good news are that we're still in the transition of digitalizing critical infrastructure. If you go to the trains, railroads, just now in most of the world, they're becoming digitalized. You can uh, start controlling the railroads from a computer and not manually like until a few years ago. And if you can still now, we can still change it and secure it because all we have to secure is the digitalization and not the old infrastructure. So Yeah, and in, and in many cases, I point out that the government in, is pushing that digitalization. We had a problem, for instance, with smart meters in the U.S., right. where the government subsidized the rollout of smart meters um, before they were tested for security, and of course they can be remotely shut off to cause uh, blackouts. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, when, <coughs> when you have initiatives that are um, uh, under, uh, um, what's the? Review. Un underpaying, I mean, when you're, when you're subsidizing uh, through government, there has to be hand in hand with that a responsibility to establish um, some kind of security model and standardization before. Uh, you had a question. Uh, my question is, you're talking about uh, antivirus and, and trust and uh, IoT, uh, and if, if an IoT device or a chip is coming from China, the, there are some, some concerns. There is now the company Kaspersky under review uh, by the US government because there are some issues with, with trust. My question is, gentlemen, what measures uh, do you recommend on a global level? Uh, so that we don't have to stop at a country level, you know, I'm sure there are some, some great Chinese companies which uh, could be trusted, uh, there are companies which, which could not uh, be trusted, Russia as well. So what measures uh, should be implemented in, in terms of uh, auditing technologies and making sure they're really secure or not? Right. So you cannot really audit technology. Uh, it's too expensive process. It exposes IP. And but I would point out, you know, China and Russia is kind of convenient, basically uh, supposedly bad guy. But in reality, majority of of the problems did not originate in that country. We did not have a recent outbreak because there was a subverted chip from the China. So we should really look where is the bulk of the problem coming is and not try to politicize and divert the resources in the areas where, you know, uh, yes, uh, you know, subversion of the chip is important if you have uh, weapons and nuclear weapons and so on, but we have to focus where the really biggest impact is and uh, where the money is and, uh, you know, we should be pragmatic rather than trying to politicize uh, basically problem. Uh, I, I agree. M most of the problems that we've seen from China are commercial problems of stealing intellectual properties versus attacking uh, in order to, to create destructive. But, uh, and, and now it's, it's changed. I believe that China have changed their plans now and they're acquiring intellectual property, properties more than stealing them. And they actually have a very clear plan of how to take over <coughs> markets in, in a commercial way. And I don't, I don't think China is the threat agents that we need to deal with, but I do agree that we cannot control where all the different parts are coming from. If you're talking about common effect where each car is being assembled from parts from over 170 different vendors, who should take responsibility, the vendors of the parts or the car manufacturer? I agree that it, it's a real question that we're still not facing. And I think that we're talking about two worlds, like there are two different worlds, the physical worlds and virtual worlds, but the question is, are they the same world or two different worlds still? Because the car is now part physical and part logical. In the physical world, we have clear rules, clear responsibilities. They're not just, just not that clear in the virtual world. And it's a real question how if you should unite the same responsibility or still share it the way it is now. Also, I would a uh, little bit touch about China because we have a lot of things to learn from the China. We talk about a lot about securing national infrastructure and communication and, and planning for that, they are actually doing that. In fact, in 2016, they, they roll uh, the basically uh, quantum-based uh, encryption network for their uh, military and the financial systems, and they actually deploy that, and we still need to do that. So, you know, uh, we should actually learn from each other, and this is example when they did the right thing, and we still have to follow it. 
So we should work rather than, uh, you know, trying to basically have antagonistic relationship. We can each learn from each other. And uh, I think that's, that's the way to go. I just have a sort of jump in because we're talking about sort of adversarial nations and the problems that they create and <coughs> the vendor problems. What about when we're talking about a nation state itself that is, and we had an example of this, of course, with the controversial example with the WannaCry, where it used um, an exploit developed supposedly by the NSA um, involving a vulnerability that wasn't disclosed to Microsoft until a short time ago. Um, so held on by a government for years. So, and not just the U.S. I mean, uh, uh, every country does this. Not every country, but uh, the major players, <coughs> intelligence agencies and governments, um, stockpiling vulnerabilities rather than uh, uh, disclosing them so that they can be uh, fixed and leaving millions of systems vulnerable. How do we deal with that problem? And, and either internally, state by state, internationally, what's the solution here? I, I think in order to answer these questions, we need to put it a bit more accurately. Okay. The, the NSA did not develop an exploit, it found a vulnerability. And anyone else could have found this vulnerability, and as far as we know, maybe someone else already found this vulnerability. Eternal Blue was an exploit. Excuse me? Eternal Blue was an exploit. So you talked about WannaCry? Eternal Blue was the exploit that WannaCry used to spread. Yeah, but it's the, it's the zero day, the vulnerability that was found, and any exploit kit could be developed and used once this vulnerability is known. It's known, sure. Um, and, and the problem is, once a, a zero day of an ability that is not known before is being discovered, who should disclose it to the vendor? And how long? And the, can the country actually keep it as a, as a competitive uh, warfare uh, mean or not? And, and I think this is the, the, the question we're trying to ask here. John? I, oh, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to I, I think it, it, it's, a, it's a war we can never win. We always have to fight, but never win. It's a chase. We'll never be able to find all the loopholes, all the zero days. And there are entities which have different uh, goals, like uh, um, financial goals in the darknet that sell zero-day attacks to... Yeah, but we're talking specifically about governments, governments withholding them. Um, I'm not talking about that you're never going to find all, every vulnerability, but when you do find them, do you, do you, what is the responsibility to disclose it so everyone can be secured or to withhold it so that you can exploit it yourself? So there, we, we have a very robust... Uh, equities review process. Vulnerabilities equities Vulner process. Vulnerabilities uh, VEP. Um, and it, it involves um, all different parts of the government. Um, and there are, I mean, just if you suggest that um, we should automatically give up a vulnerability and everything's going to be fine, that's crazy. I go to Tal's point, you know, uh, the vulnerability existed. It was located. A tool was built to exploit it. It could have been anyone, anywhere, anytime that did that. In, in, in the case of the U.S. government, the, the VEP process will look at that, look at each of those vulnerabilities that are discovered and make, try to make a determination on the value of, of that from, a, from an intelligence and a national security perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone else? We're running out of time. Well, I, I would just say as a, so, as a software vendor, I, I, I would like to think that the government would actually tell you if, you if they found a vulnerability in your software, it would seem responsible. In the same way that if we saw somebody attacking a government institution, the first thing we would do is actually contact, contact that institution and tell them they are under attack or they should prepare for atta an attack because we've seen that intelligence. You know, it, the sharing should go both ways. Mm. And there's a tremendous amount of sharing that occurs in the yes. process. I mean, it's, I mean if, you, if you take uh, Rick Ledgett's quote, who's the t recently retired uh, deputy director of NSA, 90 plus percent are disclosed in that process. And I think moreover, we've seen governments that actually uh, enforce several vendors to leave backdoors for them so, the, so they can use them later. Yeah. So it's not only about the disclosure of it, it's about who can use those backdoors. Right, and who can hijack them mm -hmm. if you do install one. So we're out of time. Um, I want to thank the audience for your participation and I want to thank the panelists. Um, for all their guidance and wisdom. And I have a couple of uh, housekeeping notes for you all. Um, we've got um, night owl sessions, off the record talks this evening that start at uh, uh, 1900, 7 p.m. Um, for those of you attending the dinner sessions, note that the buses will leave outside the hotel at 1830, 6.30. And tomorrow morning, the first session here in the Danube space starts at 9 a.m. sharp, and it will be on artificial intelligence. So please join me in thanking the panelists. Thank you. Uh, thank you.
Thank you.